This is The Hustler's Corner. Tuning into The Hustler's Corner. Welcome to The Hustler's Corner. My name is Sibusiso. DJ Smoo all the way straight out from Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm going to start with my notification gang. Go straight to that sharp sharp like sign on the count of one, two, three. Click, 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 click. Thank you very much for pressing that like button. In case you bumped into this video by mistake, I would like to invite you to become a part of this Hustlers Corner SA podcast community. Subscribe, like, share this video. If you've watched all the other videos, you would know that right now we are on chapter seven of Steve Biko's I Write What I Like, the 40th anniversary edition. We're getting into our book reading sessions. This video, we're doing our chapter seven. Let's get right straight into it. Chapter seven, fragmentation of the black resistance. This article from the Sasso newsletter of June 1971 deals with the problem faced by black leaders, whether African, colored or Indian, of working within the system. The system being the whole white racist apartheid structure built up by the nationalists since 1948, over and over again. The pattern of resistance to the apartheid created structures has been the same. First, open and defined rejection. Second, sullen acquiescence and reluctant collaboration. Lastly, capitulation and corruption. The system operates with a cruel, relentless and also with seductive bribery. Hence the success of Chief Matanzima's ruling party in the Transkai alluded to by Steve Biko in one of the closing paragraphs of this article. Of particular interest, here is the reference in the last paragraph, but two, to the amount of community work that needs to be done in promoting a spirit of self-reliance. This article was written a year before Steve Biko decided to devote himself full-time to this kind of work by joining black community programs. It would be instructive to compare the consistent integrity of all Steve's writings and attitudes on this key issue of working within the system with the utterances over a comparable period of time of any other black politician. I write what I like. Fragmentation of the black resistance. Just who can be regarded as representative of black opinion in South Africa? This question often crosses my mind in many conversations with people throughout the country and on reading various newspaper reports on what blacks have to say on topical matters. Once more, the issue was highlighted during the debate on whether or not to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Republic of South Africa. Wow. On the one hand, Mr. Pat Puvalingam is Dur in, in Durban was urging the Indian people to celebrate. Whilst on the other, people like Mr. Mewa Ramgobin and the Labour Party argued the case against celebration. In Zululand, Chief Gajabutelezi started that or stated that the Zulu people would celebrate whilst elsewhere pamphlets were distributed from various black sources reminding the people that they would be celebrating the countless sins of the nationalist government. The interesting thing, of course, was the conspicuous silence of the urban African people, except for the hushed objections of Soweto's UBC. UBC being the Urban Bantu Council. Not at any stage did anybody state a representative opinion. Anyone staying in South Africa will not be completely su surprised by this. Political opinion is probably very clear cut on issues of this nature amongst the African people especially. However, since the banning and harassment of black political parties, a dangerous vacuum has been created. The African National Congress and later the Pan-African Congress were banned in 1960. The Indian Congress was routed out of existence and ever since there has been no coordinated opinion emanating from the black ranks. Perhaps the clapdown charter, objectionable as the circumstances surrounding it might have been, was the last attempt ever made to instill some amount of positiveness in stating categorically what blacks felt 
on political questions in the land of their forefathers. After the banning of the black political parties in South Africa, people's hearts were gripped by some kind of foreboding fear for any, anything political. Not only were politics a closed book, but at every corner, one was greeted by a slave-like apathy, often bordered on timidity. To anyone living in the black world, the hidden anger and turmoil could always be seen shining through the faces and actions of these voiceless masses, but it was never verbalized. Even the active phase, thuggery and vandalism, was directed to one's kind, a clear manifestation of frustration. To make it worse, no real hope was offered by the output from the recently created black universities. Sons and fathers alike were concerned about cutting themselves a niche in a situation from which they saw no hope of escaping. After this brief spell of silence, during which political activity was mainly taken up by liberals, blacks started dabbling with the dangerous theory, that of working within the system. This attitude was exploited to the full by the Nationalist Party. Thus, the respectability of Matanzima's Transkai was greatly boosted by Ndamse's decision to join hands with him. Clearly, Ndamse, being a one-time band man, convinced many people by his decision that there was something to be gained out of these apartheid institutions. Soon thereafter, the Colored Labour Party, operating on an anti-apartheid ticket, was formed to oppose the pro-apartheid federal party within the all-colored colored representative council. People's logic became strangely twisted, said a member of Transkai's opposition Democratic Party. We know that the Transkaian parliament is a stooge body. We ask you to elect us to that stooge body. But it seems that nothing influenced people more to accept the working within the system theory that the decision by Chief Gajabutelezi to join in and lead the Zulu Territorial Authority. Chief Gajabutelezi had for a long time been regarded as the bastion of resistance to the institution of a territorial authority in Zululand. Then one morning, a newspaper in Timi, or then one morning, a newspaper intimated that he might just agree to take it up and within weeks, Chief Gachabutelezi was indeed the Chief Executive Officer of the Zululand Territorial Authority. Following the capitulation of Chief Gachabutelezi, a burst of activity manifested itself in these apartheid institutions. On the one hand, the Labour Party was making full use of the sanctified platform, the CRC, to air their grievances against the government. On the other, Chief Gajabuteles was fast becoming an embarrassment to the government with the kind of things he was saying. I believe it is just here that the confusion over who are the leaders of the black world began to rise. Because of the increased verbalization of black men's complaints, the people, especially the white world, began to take these various voices as speaking on behalf of and as leaders of the black world. This kind of picture was particularly built up by the English press, who followed in detail everything people like Chief Gachabutelezi did and said. Of course, in the absence of any organized opinion, it began to sound even to some black people themselves as if they were the militant. Oh, sorry. Let me read that line again. Apologies, guys. Of course, in the absence of any organized opinion, it began to sound even to some black people themselves as if this were the case. The fact that Matanzima also joined in the bandwagon of militant demands has made everyone sit back and clap. People argue that the nationalists have been caught in their own game, 
the black lion is beginning to raise its voice. This is a this is a gross oversimplification. What in fact is happening is that the black world is beginning to be completely fragmented and that people are beginning to talk sectional politics. I would rather like to believe that this was foreseen a long ago by the Nationalist Party and that it is in fact a part of the program. After the kind of noises made by Utelezi, the Labour Party and of late Matanzima, who can argue that black opinion is being stifled in South Africa? Moreover, any visitor is made to see that these people are fighting for more concessions in their own area, which is just 13% of the land. They accept that the rest of South Africa is for whites. Also, none of them sees himself as fighting the battle for all black people. Posas want their Transkai. The Zulus want their Zululand, etc. Colored people have a secret hopes of being classified as brown Africaners and therefore meriting admittance into the white lager while Indian people might be given a vote to swell the buffer zone between whites and Africans. Of course, these promises will never be fulfilled, at least not in a hurry. And in the meantime, the enemy bestrides South Africa like a colossus laughing aloud at the fragmented attempts by the powerless masses making appeals to his deaf ears. The trans guy is the Achilles heel of the nationalist claim intellectual politicians who are always quick to see a loophole, even in a two foot thick iron wall. This is false logic. The Transkai, the CRC, Zululand, and all other apartheid institutions are modern type lagers. I don't know it's lagers or largers. Guys, you'll forgive me with the pronunciation. I didn't go to multinational schools. <laughs> but as long as you can understand or make it on your own, it's basically L double A G E R S. So lagers. I don't know if it's pronounced lagers or largers. I'll read it again from the beginning of the sentence. This is false logic. The Transkai, the CRC, Zululand, and all these other apartheid institutions are modern type lagers or lodges behind which the whites in this country are going to hide themselves for a very long time to come. Slowly, the ground is being swept off from under our feet. And soon we, as blacks, will believe completely that our political rights are in fact in our own areas. Thereafter, we shall find that we have no leg to stand on in making demands for any rights in mainland white South Africa, which incidentally will comprise more than three quarters of the land of our forefathers. This is the major danger that I see facing the black community at the present moment. To be so conditioned by the system as to make even our most well-considered resistance to fit within the system both in terms of the means and of the goals. Witness the new swing amongst leaders of the Indian community in Durban. I must admit, I say this was with pain in my heart. Ever since word was let loose that the Indian Council will at some near future be elected, oh sorry, Ever since word was let loose that the Indian Council will at some near future be elected, a number of intelligent people are thinking of reviving the Indian Congress and letting it form some kind of opposition within the system. This is dangerous. Oh, this is dangerous retrogressive thinking which should be given no breathing space. These apartheid institutions are swallowing too many good people who would be useful in a meaningful program of emancipation of the black people. Who are the leaders of the black world then if they are not to be found in the apartheid institution? Clearly, black people know that their leaders are those people who are now either in Robben Island or in banishment or in exile. Voluntary or otherwise, 
People like Mandela, Sobukwe, Kathrada, MD Naidu, and many others will always have a place of honor in our minds as the true leaders of the people. They may have been branded communists, saboteurs, or similar names. In fact, they may have been convicted of similar offenses in law courts, but this does not subtract from the real essence of their worth. These were people who acted with a dedication unparalleled in modern times. Their concern with our plight as black people made them gain the natural support of the mass of black people. We may disagree with some things they did, but know that they spoke the language of the people. Does this necessarily mean that I see absolutely no advantage in the present setup? Unless the political astuteness of the black people involved in these various apartheid institutions is further sharpened, I am afraid we are fast approaching an impasse, impasse or impasse, you'll forgive me once again. The new generation may be right in accusing us of collaboration in our own destruction. In Germany, the petty officials who decided on which Jews were to be taken away were also Jews. Ultimately, Hitler's gangs also came from all. Ultimately, Hitler's gangs also came for them. As soon as the dissident factors outside the apartheid institutions are completely silenced, they will come for those who make noise inside the system. Once that happens, the boundaries of our world will forever be circumference of the 13% black spots. Perhaps one should be a little positive at this stage. I completely discourage the movement of people from the left to join the institutions of apartheid. In laying out a strategy, we often have to take cognizance of the enemy's strength. As far as I can assess, underestimating the influence the system, the system has on us. What seems to me to be logical at this stage is for the left to continually is to is I'll read the sentence again from the top. Sorry, guys. Kokumoya smuda. Breathe in. What seems to me to be logical at this stage is for the left to continually pressurize the various apartheid institutions to move in the direction of testing the limits of possibility within the system, to prove the whole game a sham and to break off the system. I will take the example of the Labour Party because it sounds as the most well-organized dissident group in the system. The Colored Labour Party stood for elections on an anti-apartheid ticket and won most of the elected seats. Further, the Labour Party wasted no time in spelling out its anti-apartheid stance and revived political activity to a great extent within the Colored community. In fact, the growing consciousness of the possibility of political action amongst the colored people is due to the Labour Party. Pretty soon, the Labour Party will find that it is singing the same tune and whatever they say will cease to be of, the new, of news value. In the meantime, Tom Swart will start making demands for the colored people and will probably gain a few concessions. The colored people will then realize that in fact a positive stand like that of Tom Swartz is more welcome than a negative attitude like that of the Labour Party who keep on saying the same things. Then the Labour Party will start falling into disfavor. That is not just theoretical. It is a it has happened in the past with Matanzima and Guzana in the Transke. Guzana's party wants the pride of dissident Transkayans who wanted to demonstrate their rejection of the system has now been relegated to the background, operating even on the right of Matanzima's party 
whose militant demands are being seen as a more meaningful opposition to the system than a rehashed debate on the protection of white interests in the trans sky. Therefore, I see the real value of the Labour Party being in galvanizing its forces, now organizing them and pulling out of the colored representative council together with the support of all the colored people. The longer they stay in the CRC, the more they risk being irrelevant. Pull out and do what? This is the next question. There is a lot of community work that needs to be done in promoting a spirit of self-reliance and black consciousness amongst all black people in South Africa. This is what the Labour Party should resort to doing. By now, they have sufficiently demonstrated that the CRC is rejected by the colored people. Further operation within the system may only lead to political castration and a creation of an I am a colored attitude, which will prove a setback to the black man's program of emancipation and will, and will create major obstacles in the establishment of a non-racial society once our problems are settled. This to me sounds the only way of turning a disadvantage into an advantage. It is true of not only the Labour Party, but also of all black people of conscience who are now operating within the system. Thus, in an effort to maintain our solidarity and relevance to the situation, we must resist all attempts at the fragmentation of our resistance. Black people must recognize the various institutions of apartheid for what they are. Gags intended to get black people fighting separately for certain freedoms and gains, which were prescribed for them long ago. We must refuse to accept it as we must refuse to accept it as inevitable that the only political action the blacks may take is through these institutions. Granted that it may be more attractive and even safer to join the system, we must still recognize that in doing so, we are well on the way towards selling our souls. Frank Talk. That was chapter seven of Steve Biko's I Write What I Like, the 40th anniversary edition. The next video will be chapter eight. Thank you very much. Make sure that you subscribe, you share, and you click that shop shop sign, that like button on the count of one, two, three. Click, 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 click. This is The Hustler's Corner.